And joining us on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line, a first-time guest here at the Farsi Show. Welcome in Kai Carlin. You guys know him, of course, covering the Sixers for USA Today. Sixers Wire, there's his Twitter profile. And I understand, Kai, you just had a little bit of a promotion over there at Sixers Wire. What are you doing now? Yeah, yeah, a, a little bit of a promotion. Now going from uh, just running Sixers Wire to now being the uh, basically the digital editor of all of our Wire sites. We have nine Wire sites um, we have we cover the Sixers. We have a Nets wire, a Celtics wire, Rockets, Thunder. Uh, we have a LeBron wire, um, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> because, you know, you ha- you got to cover LeBron James. He gets his own site. Um, and then we also have uh, a Lonzo wire because, you know, the, the ball families is always a good one. And um, <laughs> and we have a rookie wire. Yeah. You know, covering all, all the rookies and everything. It, it makes sense. It makes sense. So I want to ask you this because I, I want to ask you first about one of your latest articles here that you can read on Sixers Wire, of course. Uh, you also have it on your Twitter account as well. Uh, Joel Embiid. And one of the things that the article covers is the versatility of this seven-foot monster that seems to do everything on any given night. He said it himself. He could be Dirk. He could be Shaq. He could be Kobe. He could be Michael, You know, whoever. When you watch a guy like Joel Embiid, is it hard not to get caught up and just how talented this guy is and realize that it's a subject that you have to cover. It just It's crazy to kind of watch him do the things that he does at such a tall height. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, when I grew up, you, you know, it, we saw Shaq and we saw, like, um, Tim Duncan and we saw, you know, guys like that just literally just stay in the paint and they very rarely went outside. Like, you know, Duncan would occasionally knock down a jump shot, the occasional three-pointer here and there. But when you watch Joel, it's like the things that he does is crazy. Like he, a guy seven feet tall should not be able to grab a rebound and go coast to coast. Um, a guy, a, a guy at seven feet tall should not be knocking down step back three pointers as he did the other night um, in Milwaukee. I remember he knocked down a step back three in the win over the Bucks. You know, it's just it's, it's crazy things like that that just really make you sit there and be like, damn. You know, like there, there, there is not a lot of guys like him he should he just he shouldn't be able to be doing what he's doing it's 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 impressive you have to give him a ton of credit how do you think it works out with him and james harden it's officially hard and weak they play together for the first time on friday how does this work out with the two of them yeah um l- listen I, I think the two of them are really going to be a seamless fit because harden is uh, he's an underratedly smart basketball player and then i feel like a lot of people excuse me like like, like don't understand that like Harden is a guy who can fit with anybody. Uh, like, at least I feel like you see him be able to run a pick and roll with um, Clint Capella in Houston. Now he's going to be able to run it with Joel. Joel is a guy who can also pick and pop. The like the the possibilities of what can happen with those two are endless because, you know, yeah, you're taking Joel and you're pairing him up with a guy who can handle the ball. He can make plays for others. He rebounds well. And he can score at an at an elite rate. You know, this guy's led the league in scoring a, like a handful of times. I think four times, three times, something like that. So the point is, Harden is a guy who he's exactly what they need. They need a guy from the perimeter to be able to take games over when the game is, um, you know, on the line, which is pretty much what they had in Jimmy Butler. But you know, I, I digress. Um, but yeah, like Harden, Harden pretty much brings in a lot of different things that they need. He fills in a lot of needs. My concern, if I'm a Sixers fan moving forward, is uh, how do you replace Seth Curry's shooting? Because Matisse Thybul shoots under 30% from deep. For Con Corkmont shoots under 30% from deep. Danny Green uh, is having a little bit of a down year just because he's been hit with so many nagging injuries and he had a COVID issue. And hey, let's just call it for what it is. He's old. So um, you know, you, you know, the, the Sixers that they do have some issues moving forward that they do need to kind of figure out. I, I want to go back to something here because I tell me if I'm crazy. I never see Joel Embiid in that pick and roll, like especially with the way James Harden has run it, especially the way maybe a guy like Chris Paul has run that before. You rarely see Joel Embiid set the pick and then bolt to the hole. It's usually him coming out to the top of the key or whatever it might be. So can you see that kind of developing with James Harden now being here? I can, and it's because Joel is an extremely smart basketball player too. Like people just kind of see a guy who can just – um, dominate a game, but it it also takes the smarts to be able to understand what you have to do in certain situations, right? So in this specific situation this year, um, give him a ton of credit. Give the Sixers a lot of credit because without Ben Simmons and all the the, uh, the drama that has kind of been surrounded by that all season long, right? This team is thirty five and twenty three. You know, going into the All Star break, they're the number three seed in the East, and that's because Joel has understood what he has to do in order to throw the Sixers on his back in order to um, you know, have the success that they believe that they can have. Now you're adding James Harden into it. He's going to have to kind of switch up his game again a little bit. 
but he's one of those players you can tell that he gets it right like he understands what he has to do in these situations to make it work um he sacrificed a lot of his game with ben when ben was here um and then now ben's gone harden is here um he made the adjustments with jimmy butler and tobias harris when they first got here so now he's going to make another adjustment with james and i feel like it's going to it's going to be really seamless um I, I really can't really see too many for issues maybe popping up um but then again it's harden he kind of does have a history of you know pouting when things will go his way per se so again we'll have to kind of see but i, I don't really foresee many issues uh, so uh, i'm gonna put you on the spot with two questions here uh, first one is who won that trade in your opinion, the Simmons Harden trade, who won that trade. And then in a seven game playoff series, if the Nets and Sixers face each other, who do you see coming out of it? Let's see. I see this trade as a win-win. Um, but if you were to force me to like pick somebody, I'm kind of leaning towards Brooklyn. Ah, and, why? And, and here's why the Sixers got the best, the better player, obviously. I mean, in Harden, he like, he's obviously the best player, but my thing is, Ben is such a for all of his issues. He is a seamless fit in Brooklyn, and and you, you know the, I look at it as like you know with the Sixers he had to shoot, he had to score, he had to kind of do some things in order to help Joel. In Brooklyn, man, all he's got to do is play his usual elite defense and pass the ball to Katie and Kyrie. And, and if I'm hearing that you know the vaccine mandate might be lifted in New York City and Kyrie can play in home games again, then like. I, I, I mean, damn, you, you know, like that's going to be a really tough team to really stop, especially when Simmons is he's able to be, you know, Simmons is an elite defender, runner up defensive player of the year. Um, you know, you, you got a guy again, who can rebound, push the break. And all, and all he has to do is set up um, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Seth Curry. U Curry had a hell of a year last year, you know, playing next to Simmons. And then also, let's not forget Joe Harris. There's a potential Joe Joe Harris return. We don't know that yet, but if he does come back, that's another shooter you put on the floor next to Ben Simmons. And does that's incredibly tough to stop. Mm -hmm. the, that, that's all I'm going to say. It's, it's going to be incredibly tough to stop. Like Simmons, KD, and Kyrie could be more deadly than Harden, KD, and Kyrie. All right. Uh when it comes to the Sixers starting five right now, there's some debate about Danny Green possibly going back into the starting five, taking Matisse Thibel out. So there's another shooter, quote unquote, on the floor. But you had kind of just talked about Danny Green's ailments when it comes to not only injury, but also his shooting percentage. Would you keep Matisse Thibel in the starting five or would you go back to Danny Green? I would go back to Danny Green. And, and, and it's because he at least is shooting, I think, 36 percent from deep. So it's down from the 40 percent he, he shot last year. But maybe now with Harden back on the floor, maybe that percentage goes back up. Um, and who knows? Maybe a guy like Cork Maz, um, he, he, like his shooting percentage has been so low because he's had to handle the ball a bit more. Maybe because maybe now with Harden because he doesn't have to handle it much, maybe his three point percentage goes back up. Um, and that's something that could happen for Danny Green. Uh, so I feel like that could be a factor. I would start Green. I would start Thibel only for specific matchups. Um, for example, when they're playing the Warriors and you got a matchup with Steph Curry, I would start Matisse. Mm -hmm. um, because here, here's my thing. Matisse is an elite defender. Like, he's probably the best perimeter defender in the league right now, with, especially with Kawhi Leonard with his injury. I'm not counting Kawhi at the moment. So, like, like, in my opinion, Matisse is probably the best perimeter defender in the game. Those are the things that he does. It's just insane. But offensively, Mark, he is – if he's not making three-pointers, especially on this team – when Harden drives and kicks it and you're kicking it to a guy who some, some defenses don't even pay attention to him. Um, there was one game earlier in the year. I want to say I'm, I'm taking you back to November. They lost to the heat and the heat went to a zone defense and the heat could not care less if Thibel caught the ball at the perimeter. They just did not care. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, final game before the break in Milwaukee, the Bucks put Giannis on, on Matisse. And just, again, they did not care. They were just like, Giannis, leave him open. We don't care. <laughs> And in the second half, you know, like Doc started Korkmaz in Matisse's place, and Korkmaz made a difference. He knocked down two three pointers to start the second half of that game, and the Bucks had to uh, readjust. Um, and Matisse only played two minutes and fifty one seconds after halftime of that game against the Bucks, and 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 it's because again, like the Bucks did not care that Matisse was at the three point line. Mm -hmm. So until he starts knocking down his threes, Mark, you just there there there's going to be some games where you just he can't play them. It is an unfortunate truth. The only thing I do like about Matisse Thibel versus Danny Green on the offensive end is that Thibel actually does cut to the rim. He like, does. I feel like he, he does. He's been much he, better in that area. Yeah, that's the one thing I've definitely seen improvement on 
offensively speaking, when it comes to Thibel. Uh, so I'll ask you this. Generally speaking, and we, we got your answer on the Nets, but expectations for the Sixers prior to Harden, expectations for the Sixers after acquiring Harden. Okay, before the Harden deal, I potentially had them losing round one, depending on a matchup. Wow. Okay. Like, like, like if they were to be matched up with like Milwaukee round one without Harden, like before mm. the Harden trade, if they were to be matched up with Milwaukee round one, because the East has been so jumbled up this year, um, yeah, like if they were to match up with the Bucks or the Nets or the Heat or the Cavs or something like that round one, like you, you could see them losing round one. You really could, despite Joel's great, Joel's dominance. Um, but then now that they get Harden, I potentially see a possible Eastern Conference Finals run depending on matchups again, like they could lose round two again, right. but they get the right matchups. They, they can make the Eastern conference finals because of how, like I, I truly believe the Embiid Harden duo can be something really tough to stop. All right. I'll keep my fingers crossed there. Uh, I have to ask you the MVP question. Joel Embiid MVP of the league so far. Yeah. Right. Right now, especially when you consider everything that's going on with this team this year, Mark, let, like, let's be real. I mean, the, the Sixers should not be where they're at right now. They just shouldn't. Um, and, I, and I feel like Doc Rivers deserves a lot of credit, too. I feel like he should at least get some type of Coach of the Year consideration. Wow. Um, okay. But, because, again, I mean, with the whole Ben Simmons nonsense and the injuries and the COVID issues, and this team is 35 and 23, Joel should be – Joel, in my opinion, is the MVP right now. He's leading the league in scoring. He'd be the first big man to lead the league in scoring since Shaq in 2000 if he can, if he can finish it up. And, you know, that's crazy to think about 22 years or 21 years have gone by without a big man leading the league and scoring that that's that's crazy. Joel could break that streak if he can keep this up. So I feel like he's the MVP at the moment. And I do believe Doc should at least receive consideration for coach of the year. Awesome. All right. Uh, now, that was the last question I have on basketball. Since you're a first time guest on the show, I want to play a little fast five with you, if that's OK with you. And you know what? I might actually do this. I might actually put music to the interview, if you don't mind. Is that cool? That's perfectly fun. All right, let's see if this actually works here. Let me see. Let's see if this fits the mood. Okay. <laughs> Not really, but the hell with it. I'm going with it. Here we go. Kai Carlin, <laughs> fast five. First question. Best job. Okay, this is just weird. I can't do this. Is Let me switch. Oh, this says rock, so that means it's going to be awesome. Here we go. First question. Best job before the job? Uh, Probably lifeguarding. Oh, you were a lifeguard. I, li I lifeguarded for nine years, like all throughout high school and college, and then like a couple years even after college before I got this gig. Yeah. Okay, lifeguard. That's pretty solid. Like at the the, the, the actual beach, a pool. Where were you lifeguarding? It, it was the, strictly pools. I wasn't in the mood to like you know be messing with beach stuff. <laughs> so I was not in the mood for all of that. And then also, uh, pool pools offered the opportunity to work in the winter time too because of indoor stuff. So like you know. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's good. All right, go to fast food place. Chick-fil-A. Back to back Chick-fil-A. Mark Jackson was on last week. He said Chick-fil-A as well, but he just goes there for the fries apparently. Just the fries. Uh cuz he's a he's a pescatarian, that fella. Oh, uh okay. if you didn't know that, fun fact. All right. Uh question number 3. First date deal breaker. You're on a first date. Person can't do this. What is it? Uh I'll have to say being rude to the staff. You and me, bro. You and me. Same one. Same one. Uh, question number four. Favorite city to travel to? Um, Probably Miami. I, I mean, just because a couple reasons. First of all, it's Miami. And two, like my entire family is in South Florida right now. I'm the only one that lives up here. So whenever the Sixers get to go to Miami, you know, I get to not only cover the game, but I get to see my family as well. So, <laughs> Do they pity you for having to live like uh, in a place that snows? Oh yeah, all, all the time because on, on Christmas Day it was like it was like 78, 80 degrees down there. Up here it was like I don't know, thirty two or something. So mm -hmm. big difference. Yeah. Gotcha. Last question, Kai Carlin, uh, Sixers Newswire, uh, USA Today. Question number five and final question: In traffic, what makes you beep your horn? People who don't know how to merge, like people that don't like don't like put their uh, their traffic signal on when when like like let's just say like the lane is closing and they need to get to the your lane and they just kind of do it without giving you the heads up like hey I'm trying to get in your lane like I mean I, I can't stand that. <laughs> well, those are five great answers. I score you five out of five on all I of like these I because like I, I too was once a lifeguard, my friend. I too once was a lifeguard. Kai Carlin, make sure you guys read all his stuff. The guy does a phenomenal job for Sixers Newswire. Uh, here, once again, is his Twitter profile, so you guys can give him a follow 
at Kai. That's K Y underscore Carlin. Check him out right there. Sixers Newswire USA Today. Uh, Kai, great talking to you, man. We'll have you on again. Thanks so much for joining us. Mark, thank you so much for having me on, man. I definitely appreciated it. Absolutely. Kai Carlin joining us here on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line.